like the Christmas season? Can I see your hand? Don't you just like it? And I know for folks like us, it's especially good this year because nobody has to avoid home. Everybody's going to show up hungry this year. Nobody's going to get the biscuit test at the door. Nobody's going to ask you how you doing and really mean, do you have warrants? I mean, they're going to, when they say, how are you doing? They really just mean, how are you doing? Amen. I used to walk in and my family from out of town, from Mississippi, they'd be like, how are you doing? And I knew that really meant like, is anybody looking for you? Should you be here? You know, how you doing? And I'm going to try to stay behind the podium. Sorry, Andy, I'm already up to no good. Um, so what a wonderful time of year. What a cause to celebrate this year. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. We're going to celebrate the coming of the Lord and Savior. We're going to celebrate uh, goodwill and peace toward men this year in sobriety and with a, yes. with a hope and a future and all that stuff available to you and me from Abba Father. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that he withholdeth no good thing from those that love him. That's, right. That's a big statement to make. Yeah. When he says that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think, it comforts me to know that taking into consideration what I'm able to come up with he can and will and even wants to do greater than my expectations if there be a power that works inside of me. The Holy Spirit Amen. got to be at work on the inside of you. Amen. And tonight we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. And if you saw Facebook, you saw the title of tonight's message. It's either sons or bastards. You decide. Sons and daughters or bastards. I know that's not a politically correct word, but that's King James Version Bible. It's the Bible I've been using since I was 18. I ain't going to change because there ain't nothing wrong with it. Amen? I've got something that's worked for centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries, and I don't find an overwhelming need to change anything or to look further than the Bible that I've come to know and love. And the Bible says some very eye-opening statements about our sonship with the Father. Many of us will not necessarily like what we hear tonight, but I want to tell you that the Bible says that the things that were written in here was written for our profit. It's written so that you can know, so that you can believe, so that you can have life and life more abundantly if you do it this way. You can't read it this way and do it another way and get what the Bible says you can get. I know a lot of churches do the pledge and they say, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. That's true. If you're a son. Yeah. If you're a daughter. Yeah. And you can't just say I'm a son. You can't say I'm a daughter. You actually have to be right. a son. You have to be a daughter. And there's only way you can do that. That's the rebirth. Yeah. And so what we're looking for. First and foremost. Is the rebirth. Because without the rebirth. There's nothing for you to experience. Yeah. Spiritually things will be spiritually discerned. And understood. Carnal, earthly things cannot be understood by a spiritual person. Spiritual things cannot be understood by a carnal person. We're looking for a heart change. A metanoa. The shifting of the mind. The anachronosis. Renovated. Renewed. Regenerated. Made new. For every addict that's actually really changed his life, God did a work on the inside of him via the Holy Ghost that he don't really even understand how it happened, but it's obvious that it did happen. Amen? Why? Because it's a changed life. Not because he goes around preaching, but because he lives a new life. He lives a new life. And so 
Let's look in Hebrews chapter 12 for a few minutes because there's some things that uh, we need to be aware of because some of us can be deceived. There's been times in my life when I was deceived. If I had read this part of the Bible, laid it out in clear outline form, and then took a personal inventory of my life and what the book says, I would have had to admit, nope. I'm not a son. There's not, there's not been a metanoia. There's not been a true change. I'm white knuckling it. I'm in church. Things are better. And that can happen. You can go to church and things get better because you're around different people. It's a different environment. You'll be encouraged. You'll be, uh, you'll be uh, in the midst of people that are being blessed by the Lord. And guess what? Who blessings fall on? If there's a righteous house and an unrighteous house right next to it, when it rains, which houses get hit? Both. So things can get better by coming to church, but there's no true change that is a forever change unless something happens on the inside of you, then you're the church wherever you go. Amen. Then you'll be going down the road talking to your co-workers on the way to work and you're having church in the car. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be talking on the phone to mama or brother or one of the family members the next thing you know you're talking about spiritual matters and you're having church right there over the phone when there's a true change it's not about going to a place it's becoming the body of Christ amen excuse me let's read in Hebrews chapter 12 there's there's a multitude of messages that will eventually come out of this I'm actually going to start at the end, and then over the next few weeks, I'll work backwards because the Bible says that wisdom is knowing the end of the matter. How many of you knows if the drunkard could see on the first day what the end of his life would look like with lifelong alcoholism, chances are he wouldn't drink. If the meth addict knew from the beginning just how bad it was going to get, there wouldn't be no dope heads. Amen. Wisdom is knowing the end of the matter. And so let's read here. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Picture in your mind a race, an Olympic game, because that's what is being referenced here in this chapter. Uh, the, the culture of that day being uh, heavily a Greek culture, the Olympic Games were, were a, a big part of their culture and their community and their daily life. And so many uh, passages in the Bible are going to be symbolisms of those types uh, of situations, things that they used to teach. And so uh, the, the, the message here, the type here, is that there is a race, and just as in the Olympic Games, there were real important people in a particular place in the stands, and everybody had their eyes fixed on them. All of the runners were, were trying to win the race and impress and to please the judges and the, uh, the people of importance that were there watching. And the Bible says that there uh, is, a, is a cloud of witnesses that is watching and just as they were exhorted to lay aside every weight and run that race with the intention to win, to please the captains of the race, even so we are to uh, run our race and to please our Heavenly Father who is the judge of all things. Looking unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith. I preached a message one time called... Put your pencils down. Um, I don't know if you remember back in school when you'd be taking a test and they'd time it. When you got to the end of the time, they'd say, okay, pencils down. And I usually wasn't done. I usually had a lot left to go and it usually wasn't a good day for me when the tests were timed. But spiritually, I would say at this point, I want you to put your pencil down. Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of your faith. There's nothing you need to do or add to or to accomplish or to manipulate or to create in your own power 
or to sustain under your own strength yes. that Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of your faith, won't do Amen. of his own will and his own doings. Amen? Amen? So he's the author and finisher of our faith. And one of the noteworthy points there is that author means he is the beginner. He is the source of our faith. He starts it. Sunday I preach uh, a message called The Measure of Faith. I was riding with people in uh, Mississippi over the weekend. We got to talking about that measure of faith and I thought, I need to do that. I need to do that because really when we preach, we're looking for a measure of faith. Every last one of us has been given a measure of faith, the Bible says. And when we preach, what we're doing is we're shooting the fire of God's word Hopefully over an open gas line. And if there's anything in you at all, it will ignite. And it will become a consuming fire. And you'll be what they call on fire for God. That's how it happens. But the measure of faith gets buried. The cares of this life. It gets buried with the troubles and the struggles and the disappointments and the anxiety and the medications and the addictions and the divorces and the abuse and the neglect. All these things in life that get thrown on top of your measure of faith make it difficult to get down there to it. That's why we preach the word of God. It goes down, the Bible says. All the way down to the heart. Discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is what penetrates the garbage in your life. When the Bible says that if they be lost, it's because the God of this world has blinded them. That they cannot see. And we preach the word of God hoping that the veil is lifted. Hoping that the word gets down and penetrates deep down and finds that measure of faith. And you come to life. If it comes to life, I don't have to do much training. I don't have to do much encouraging. I don't have to do much cheerleading. Somebody that gets on fire for God, you have to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not go, go, go. But preachers today find themselves telling their people, get up, go, let's go, yeah. It's because there's nothing being lit. There's no fire burning. They're coming to church because things are somewhat better being a part of community. There are some good things that you take away from being in the house of God. Counsel. Expression through music, all these things. I mean, you can sit in the car and play your favorite sad song and feel better. Sometimes all I need is a good cry. Well, you can get these types of things from the house of God and not truly be set on fire for God, not truly be changed, not truly be a son of God, and you'll go through life always needing something to charge your battery. You'll go through life in the house of God always needing the pastor to feed you. And look, I got a little newsflash for you. You're supposed to be feeding yourself. Every day he said, go out and get the man to gather for you and your family. If you're depending on me to give you a week's worth, you're toast. And I can't keep up. I can't fill you up. I can come shoot the fire of God's word across what you've already got burning in your heart. And if there is something, you'll run with that for the rest of the week. Amen. You'll leave Sunday and Monday. You'll be telling your co-workers about what happened to church, about what God's doing in your life, about the word of God that's being preached without compromise. Amen. Because I want you to be true sons and daughters of God and not bastards. I don't want you to be illegitimate child. I don't want you to be the ones at the gate saying, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And Jesus said, you can do them in my name. I didn't know you. You can't go buy something on my account if I don't authorize it. If I catch you, I'm going to get you. You got to be a son to actually be doing it under the authority and for the glory of God. You've got to be bought with a price in your life hid in Him. Amen. You've got to be dead to self. It's got to be not about what I can get. It's not about the comfort of my life. It's not about the quality of life. It's about the servitude to the King that gave Himself for the, for the pauper, for me. It's realizing that I have nothing to gain by getting my own will. 
Truth be known, if I could get what I've worked out in my head, the whole thing would fall apart. Go to hell in a handbasket. Because I don't even know what I need. The Bible testifies that the Spirit made an intercession for me because I don't even know what to ask for. And I esteem myself as being a learned Christian. I esteem myself as knowing just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit. And the Bible says even then, I don't know what I'm supposed to be asking for. You see how important it is for you to be a son, for you to be a daughter? Yes, amen. It's important for you to be bought with a price, are you? <laughs> Can anybody tell it if you don't say it to them? Or do you have to convince people that you're a Christian? Whoops. You shouldn't have to put a Jesus sticker on the back of your car for people to know you're a Christian. Let me tell you something, what I know about, there was a blue matrix out in the parking lot today. The Brother Randy's and Sister Gloria's. I know that car like the back of my hand. I went out there and I saw it from the side. I seen, I knew whose car it was. I know that's a Jesus loving car. I've seen it pulling in church, pulling out of church, going to the other side, coming here. I've seen that church in so many Christian functions. There ain't got to be no crosses on it. They ain't got to have no fish on the back. I know that car, who it belongs to, and what they stand for. Yes. Amen. 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 Our life should be that way. Somebody should see your truck coming down the road and go, that's a Christian. Amen. Bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Life miraculous of change. Feet set upon a rock. Establishes going. And now he's got a life that he's proud of. And... and and glorifies God for His goodness. So continue to make it. Say, That's what they ought to say about us. So there's a cloud of witnesses. There's a weight. The Bible says that we've got to put off the weight. There's some things that are going to keep you from getting off the ground. And you've got to get rid of those weights. They might have a name. You might need to throw some Jonas out of the boat. So that you don't wind up somewhere you really don't want to go. So that your ship don't sink. You need to get rid of weight. You might have to get rid of some stuff. The Lord may ask you to give up some things in this life that maybe ain't necessarily a sin. But he's asking you to put it down so that you can come up higher. Amen. Would you do it if he asked you to? Amen. Could you give up the smokes if he asked you to? If he said, I'll give you a deeper intimacy with me, could you do it? I ain't going to bring up Facebook. <laughs> I ain't going to bring up Facebook. The cloud of witnesses, the weight, the sin, the besetting sin, the favorably situated sin that finds you day in and day out. The sin that you've made room for in your life. The sin that your daily routine allows time and place. We've all got it. Yeah, yeah. From the preacher back. Don't let nobody tell you that they don't. Let me tell you about one benefit that you have here. I'll be the first and quickest one to admit my junk. Because I want you to know that there's nobody from the pulpit back whose righteousness is anything but filthy rags. I am dirt. Taken from the dirt, I'm going back to the dirt. The only good thing in me is Christ. Amen. And sometimes I have a hard time getting that for sure. The sin, the race, the faith, the judge, the verdict. A lot of times when people say, why are you judging me? I'm not judging, I'm reading the verdict. God judged you, he wrote it in the Bible, I'm just telling you what the Bible said. I'm not judging you, I'm just saying it's so. The Bible says that in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. They, in the last days, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. That means those who are in the faith will leave. Why? Because they're not sons and daughters. 
We're going to look at the marks of a real son and a real daughter. Here it is. Let's pick it up in verse 4. You've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son or my daughter. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. They are, at this point, repeating Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. Where it said, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourge every son whom he delighteth. The mark of a son or a daughter is that they are receiving the chastening that is the discipline of the Lord. The Lord will probably not come down and do the chastening himself. He will probably not send an angelic being to appear in bodily form at the foot of your bed at night. If he does, good for you. More than likely what you've got is the preaching and teaching of God's word. More than likely what you've got is a good friend in your ear saying, wait a minute, brother. Wait a minute, sister. This is not the way we're supposed to do it. These are not the things you said you were going to do with the rest of your life. These are not the changes you said that were made. And I'm holding you accountable to what you know is right. It was recently mentioned to me that maybe some people are too old to be corrected. No, that's the case. It doesn't have anything to do with age, but some people will not be corrected. They're in it. They'll volunteer. They'll be over something. They'll run something until you have to correct them. And then they'll go find somebody, another church, that will accept the behavior. And they're bastards looking for a bastard church that will allow them to continue. To continue in their job. The only hope you have. Is that somebody. And you know we're the crowd. That needs somebody to say. Brother. I'm noticing something. Sister. I've been hearing something. And I just want you to know. That I'm not judging you. That I love you. I know you was there. You heard the preaching. I know you've been reading your Bible. And it says what you know it says. And it looks like you're going astray. And I just want to encourage you to come back to what you know is God's word. Amen. If you don't have that, you're not your here. Love that is not conjoined with reproof is not genuine. Love that is not conjoined with reproof is not genuine. If you get in a relationship and she says you're perfect, and there is nothing about you that needs to change. She's a liar from the pit of hell. And so is he if he says it to you, ladies. We've all got our junk. We're all broken people. We're all of the same category who our righteousness is but filthy rags. There's none good, no, not one. None of us have made it. None of us are the example. None of us are enough like Christ to where we don't need from time to time somebody to say, wait a minute, thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Amen. We don't do those things anymore. And the son or daughter of God will say, you're right. Amen. And the bastard won't. That's it. There's no more debate. There's no more you convincing anybody. There's no more you testifying and trying to con convince and trying to win somebody in to your delusion right there. You either take correction as a son and daughter of God or you ain't his. That's it. That's what the Bible says. Can you be corrected? Don't you want to be? For those of 
those of us who've been in these programs, if it wasn't for somebody correcting us, we wouldn't even have a life. We'd still be in our addiction. We'd still be in our junk if we weren't willing to let somebody speak in our lives and to be accountable to somebody for a time and a season. Yeah. Well, when the time for you to have um, for, for the time for you to have teachers and uh, preachers over you on a daily basis and counselors and things like that, when you when you when you graduate and you move out on your own, you've got God's word and it's just it's yeah. it's, it's the highest authority. It's where your teachers and your preachers and your counselors get their authority. I can only tell you what, what I know to be true about this Bible. Nobody, nobody gave me a million dollars and changed my life. I didn't have any lucky breaks and things just go my way. Little by little. Line by line, precept by precept, I started to apply God's word to my life because my way was 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 horrible. It wasn't working. I was 35 years old and I had nothing. And I figured, you know, there's people there's people that I know that's doing it this way, and they're having a measure of success. I think I'll try it that way. And if it don't work. I'll go back to getting high. That's how I started out. That's what I said. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give it an honest go. If the Lord don't reveal himself to me, if the Holy Ghost don't show up and change me from the inside out, I'm not going to white knuckle it. I ain't got that kind of strength. I don't have the attention span anymore. I'll feel like it's all me. I'll feel like it's forced. I'll feel like a relationship I'm not supposed to be in. You ever had one of them? Where it's just a constant grind. You're having to make it work. You're always... Never happy, you're dealing with some junk. Okay, well, being in the faith is not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be walking around with a smile on your face, not because everything's going your way, but because you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you know that He's able to provide everything you need. If you're a son, your willingness to accept discipline is testimony for or against rebirth. A lot of us, if you're like me, quit listening to mom and dad a long time ago. My parents are decently successful. They're not rich, but they've been good. They've been smart with their money. Uh, ever since I can remember, we've never went without. They've always been able to do um, you know, what they wanted to do in life and and to provide for uh, the family. And they've been, they, they've been, they've been what I wanted to, to be for a long time. When I was in my addiction, I would look at my parents' life and say, I want that. Yeah. And I knew that I was smart enough, like I wasn't stupid. I know that I could do that. <laughs> It wasn't a lack of want that kept me from having it. It was a lack of discipline. Yes. It was a lack of discipline. Let's look at verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Lord or the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, where of all are partakers... Then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more reverence and subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure or their own will, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Remember the Bible says without holiness no man shall see the Lord. You better quit letting them lie to you, telling them that grace covers all your junk and that you ain't got to worry about getting victory over sin. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says, without holiness, ain't nobody going to see the Lord. That's it. That's it. You might as well clap for that. If you can't clap, just say ouch. Amen. It's just one of the two. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So how am I going to pursue holiness? The rebirth. I'm going to become a son 
I'm going to abide in him so that he will abide in me. I'm going to get connected to the vine so that what flowed through him will flow through me and come from the inside out. And over time, the garbage will continue to leave as the fruit begins to press out. <coughs> and you begin to reap harvest in your life. And you'll find that you don't have the same struggles that you always had. And no, you're never going to be pure holy. That's why Christ is a propitiation for your sin. He's the fulfillment. He is the payment. He's what's owed on the debt when you die. If you die without him, I don't care if you was this far from holy. You ain't going. But with him, if Christ is in you, then you'll make it. Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Can you take correction? Correction is where people get mad and leave. Yeah. Yeah. Correction separates the members from the visitors. The Bible talked about seed that didn't produce a harvest. One of the reasons being that they didn't have any roots. And if six months into your new church life, the pastor corrects you or a Sunday school teacher or by all means, somebody in the pews comes to you in the spirit of correction, in the spirit of love, wanting to encourage, wanting to bless, wanting to call you up into a higher intimacy with the Lord, comes to you with some form of correction and you leave after six months, you're just starting all over. Please get somewhere and stay. Please get somewhere and be a part of the body of Christ. Get somewhere and let God begin to do a work in your life that can only be done over time. You can run to and fro from church to church, waiting on the perfect situation, trying to find the perfect band, trying to find the perfect teacher, trying to find the perfect preacher, trying to find the right lights and the smoke and the fog machine and all that. But look, you're going to have to get somewhere and stay yes. for God to do a work in your life. Yes. There's some things you've got to have roots for. Yes. Now, verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness... Unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but, leather, uh, but let it rather be healed. Amen. Do you know that when God begins to chasten you, when He begins to discipline you, He's wanting you to be healed? Yes. If He doesn't chasten you, if he doesn't come against you, if he doesn't allow a confrontation to come into your life. And look, it's saying it's never going to come in a time where it seems joyous. Wow. Nobody's going to correct you and you say, man, I needed that. <laughs> Thank you. I knew something was missing. They're going to say you're a jerk. They're going to say, how dare you, you pompous jerk. How dare you judge me? Who are you? I know what you do. I know what kind of life you used to live. You ain't no holy man of God. Blah, 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 blah. Look, God's going to use people like you and me to talk to people like you and me. That's it. Ain't nobody coming down from heaven. Ain't no light shining in. He's not going to take over the soundboard and start talking through my mic. It's going to be me talking to you and you talking to me and you talking to each other. That's it. That's the voice of God in your life. As long as it comes from this right here. That's how you know when it's God. Because it comes from this right here. Has anybody ever come to you and said, you know, God told me something else, but the Bible says something else. I bet I know, brother, God didn't tell you that. God didn't tell you anything that wasn't between the covers of this book. Because he knows how bad we'll mess it up. And I don't want to be confused. And you don't need to be confused. If what you're saying ain't between the covers of this book, you're wrong. The Bible says it's that way. He said, let God's word be true. Let every man be found a liar. 
If it comes down to what I say or what the Bible says, I'm wrong. The Bible's right. Amen. Now, we amen that fast, and you think that's a moot point, but look, there's, there's, there's homosexual preachers now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. There's homosexual friendly popes in office. Yep. There are sin friendly pastors and churches that uh, we don't get into all that here. Well, you don't get into the Bible. Amen. You don't get into sonship of God. You don't get into I'm bought with a price. You don't get into the metanoia. You don't get into the life change. You come and are tended to for a while, and when you bail, you repeat the cycle. Yeah. Period. Yeah. What else can you do if you're not changed except what you've always done? Yes. The marks of a changed person will be that they will accept correction. I've had to do it. Some of you corrected me. And I had to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. That's it. Can you take correction? Will you run? You got to be willing to accept correction. It is how you grow. It is how you change. You showed up here broken. I showed up here broken. I have to be willing to be wrong. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. You know what happens when somebody can't take correction? They start blasting you to everybody that sits around them. They start slaughtering your name. Because you had the guts to speak up and to speak into their lives and try to save them from hell. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That portion of scripture right there ought to put some concern in your life. Amen. It says that a man with tears sought repentance and was rejected. Does that sound like the gospel preached at most of your churches today? No. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift. Partakers of the Holy Ghost, partakers of those gifts and those spiritual gifts. If they shall fall away to renew them to repentance. Oh, you can just repent. Come on back. You just, just get up and just, everything will be all right. That may be, but the Bible don't promise that. The door of the ark was open till God shut it. And then no repentance could be found. So if the door's open, good. But don't plan on the door being open the next time you repeat history. <laughs> Don't take for granted that you can always just come home back that everything's going to be okay. One of these times it's going to get you. Amen. One of these times you're going to get one of them long rides down at ADC. One of these times you're going to get something that'll kill you and put it in your arm. Amen. Not everybody comes back, people. The Bible talks about a father-son relationship. Let me give you two responsibilities of a father real quick. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me tell you something. The aha moment of a child that is wayward better be that my father was right. I think I'll go back to his house. It better be the aha that the prodigal son had. What am I doing here? My, my father was right the whole time. I'm going home. They better not say, I, my dad knew better. <laughs> this is my dad's fault. This is my father's fault that I'm this way. You have a responsibility, the Bible teaches, to train your child in the way yes. he should go. Yes. Yes. 
Because if you don't, when little Johnny's 35 years old, he is going to hold you to blame. Yep. And he'll be justified in doing so. The child is going to do what is modeled at home. That's it. If you never learn how to be givers, guess what? Your children will probably not be givers. If you can't understand small spiritual principles like pay your tithe, your babies ain't going to pay their tithe. If you can't get that you're not supposed to forsake the assembling of yourself together in the house of God so that you can be strengthened, so that you're prepared for this week, your babies ain't either. They're going to grow up and do what they see us doing right now. And we have the responsibility to train the child in the way he should go. That's what your Abba Father is trying to do for you now. He's trying to train you. Guess, he's going to, guess who he's going to use to do it? The people of God. The people that love you. And if your friends don't have the authority to correct you, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because you're not okay. You don't got this. I don't got this. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Will you allow yourself to be corrected? Will you allow people to speak into your life? Will you allow God to do a work? Will you allow Him? I know we read the passage. He which begun a work in me is going to finish it. Not if you don't stay put. Right. Not if you don't let nobody speak into your life. Not if you got the know-it-all syndrome. Not if can't nobody tell you nothing. He can't finish. He can't even get started good. You think you're okay and we're not. Bible says to be diligent. To look carefully after these things, lest we should fail the grace of God. Do you know how much love God has for us? He brought you all the way from California. So that you could hear the preaching of God's word. I might not be the most eloquent, but I will tell you what it says. I'll tell you the truth. I promise you. I'll always see. I see will always be a place where we go right out of the Bible. Like it or not. I'm not going for the numbers. I'm setting my affections on things above. I'm laying up my treasures in heaven. I can't get nothing from you that will sustain me. Amen. You can't get nothing from me. It's just got to be this right here. And I'll do my best to make it edible. But I can't sugarcoat it. I can't, I can't cut it. I'm going to have to give you the real stuff, the pure stuff. Ain't that what you always wanted? Come on now. Let me get a witness from you. We don't want none of that cut stuff. Give me the real, give me the, give me the real deal. I can, I can take it. Can you take it? If you can take it, would you stay on your feet? If you can take the real stuff, keep an appetite for that. Don't ever let nobody give you something less than the written word of God. I don't need nobody's take on it. I don't need them to paraphrase and to get. The Bible says that they would uh, not endure sound doctrine, but they would be turned unto fables. Yeah. You know what fables are? They're them little teaching stories. And that's what you get now in a lot of churches. You get stories. You get, you get story time. You get the crumpets. You get the muffins. You get the coffee. 
But they will not give you the Word of God. They will not give you the spiritual meat. That's all we have to offer. And that's all that's on the menu. Amen. 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 Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember that the only way we can be changed is to allow you to speak into our lives. If you use the teacher, if you use the director, if you use the pastor, if you, if you use the friend, if you use the co-worker, Lord, help us to be open to correction yes. and reproof yes. and rebuke and exhortation, Lord, so that we might truly be disciplined in spiritual matters. Yes. It's not punishment. It's discipline. Yes. It's so that we learn. It's so that we can be narrowed into that narrow gate. Yes. Help us, Lord, to find the mark. We trust you with our lives, Lord, and we depend on you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for setting our feet upon a rock and establishing our goings. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, that testifies, Lord, that is witness, Lord, that we are truly changed, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Lord, we love you. We praise you for the birth of your Son. Thank you for the gift of redemption. Yes. As we move into this holiday season, I pray for traveling mercies. I pray that people would gather in the spirit of family and friends, remembering that 2,000 years ago, the Savior was born. And it's because of him that we have newness of life. We thank you for that and we love you. Let all God's children say amen. amen. And you can be dismissed.